And still on the bench is a somewhat overcomplicated AWA AD FF90 cassette deck. In the last episode we fixed a burnt out motor, a missing 12 volt supply and a fair few mechanical gremlins what with it being assembled not quite as the factory intended. Ok sit rep, things have moved on but not in a good way. My vintage scopes lost a channel and the motor I rebuilt gone wonky. Luckily there's no shortage of scopes on this bench. I've also loosened off the front panel so I can get better access to the main board because I think it's going to get rather complicated. I was hoping not to have to mess with this motor again but I'll show you what's up. It's best heard with this test tape. That motor's been calibrated to play this tape with 3kHz output and look at it, it's all over the place. Although not so bad now I have to admit but it does drift up and down. I don't fancy taking that tape mechanism out again so I'm going to try and work on the motor in situ I reckon it's a problem on the board, maybe. It doesn't probably it's 12 volts on the motor. 12.3 volts mean, a little bit ripply though. I'll play the tape, just put some load on it. No, it's not so great. Hmm. And now it's running faster, look. I should probably sort the power supply ripple out before I start blaming the motor too much but I don't think it should cause that problem. It should be sort of independent of the voltage but I suppose I'm changing some caps. Just fetch the back off again. And the main power supply caps must be these here. And this one even looks a bit heat stressed with these plastic covers sort of shrunk. <laughs> In fact they are rather hot. Blimey. Hmm. It's not just that. Yeah, they definitely want changing I reckon. Although this one nearest the back is quite new, look at it, it's not the original, you can see the glue at the bottom has been pulled away. Must have been a problem before. Let's start with this one first. This one's got the glue on it. There we go. There's one more hiding down there. They've definitely underestimated the size of these caps on this board layout. They're a lot bigger than those circles. <laughs> Just with kicks, I'm going to test this newer Rubicon cap. See if it's actually as good as I think it is. Yeah, the Rose Gallery, some of these do look rather worn out, I reckon. <laughs> but this one doesn't. Looks very modern to me. In fact, I think that's a 2008 date code, maybe. Still fairly old, I guess. Let's test these one by one. Start with the newish Rubicon. Eh, just under two millifarads. Okay, not bad. This is the old 2200. What's this? Wow, 2.2 millifarads. Um, I don't know what to say. That's really good. This is supposed to be a thousand microfarads. Yeah, not too far off. Four forty? Not terrible for a four seventy mic cap. Not the disaster I'm looking for to be honest. Yeah, slightly worse. Finally, what's this one? Four hundred that one is low, but yeah. I was hoping it would be like 50. <laughs> but again, not the disaster I was thinking of. Let's clean some of these holes out. Oh, rescue that a little bit. <laughs> Well, then with the new caps, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. I 
Let's just bend its legs a little bit. Stop it falling out. And another brand new Rubicon in here. Well, a lot neater, and it'll keep the capacitor police off my back, but I'm not convinced this is going to fix it. Moment of truth. Let's see that nice steady DC. <laughs> Looks the same to me. How about plain? No, I think that's no different whatsoever. That's that a caps wasted, if you ask me. Let's knock the power off and get inside that motor. Comes off a bit easier now, I have to say. The motor's a bit loose now, so I'm going to jam these tweezers under here. Stop the motor coming adrift. And hopefully I can just remove the board just like this. There we go. I'm just going to solder wires onto here so I can run the board externally from the motor. And I have remembered that little positive on there I drew on is wrong. <laughs> so I'll put the wires the other way around. I'll put these wires in this little hole here. I can put the cap back on. In fact, I'm going to disconnect this entirely. I run this off a bench power supply just to prove it works. Just tack the motor wires on here. All these red wires still need to be joined together. Let's not forget that. Let's connect this to the bench power supply. Give it 12 volts. That's still running quite quick, but it's starting to fall slightly. It's kind of interesting, I wonder what the voltage is on the motor. 6.6 volts. So you can see the input voltage hasn't got much to do with it. I've got a theory this chip might be a bit dodgy. I'm going to warm it up at the end of the iron. Oh. Yeah, that's it gone temperature dependent. We're a bit leaky. Try freezing it. Unfortunately I think this AN6618 driver chips had it. It's no good for speed regulation. I also mentioned I can't find any of these to buy or any data for them really so I'll have to put something more modern in. It's a complete new circuit I reckon. And this thing looks perfect and I've even got one. Brilliant. And it really has simplified the design. There's only four pins and if you scroll down there's even an application note. I had to wire it up. How easy is that? Lovely. I'm just going to test this circuit on the breadboard first because I've got to make this fit in the back of the motor which means I'm going to have to do a custom PCB and I don't want to do that and find out it doesn't work. <laughs> Here's a trust yard breadboard. I've seen many designs prototypes on it before. Start with the motor driver chip. Let's get the legs to bend in. Pin 1's a 12 volt supply, let's pop that in there. Pin 2's got a 330 ohm resistor going to the 12 volt rail as well. Pin 3 is ground. Pin 4 goes to a little trim pot. The other side of that goes to pin 2. And of course the motor output is also on pin 4. So that 
that's the ground, that's the 12 volts, that's the motor negative, and motor positive I'll put in here. Well they haven't specifically wired in the positive so here we go. Just unsolder the motor wires. There's your lip. Put these crop clips on the cables there. Power it on. Six milliamps, that's a good sign. Well, it's definitely going slower than it used to. <laughs> but how slow? Start the tape. Yeah, that is running slow. Let's see if I can adjust it. Give it the thermal test, put the soldering iron against it. Making no difference. Now the freezer spray. Freezing it doesn't do a lot. Good. So I think I found a nice stable solution. I just need to build it or design it. So the new circuit's got to fit in the motor exactly how this did. So I'm going to measure this board up and make an accurate copy of it. I also need to have the adjustment pot in the same place so it lines up with the hole. I also need to be aware I need to have a bit of space around where the motor goes and the middle because there's parts of the motor that interfere with it. I think I'm also going to steal this choke off here because it recommended a choking line so I might as well use that one and I might use the same pot because there's nothing wrong with it. So I've drawn up the motor control board in KeyCAD this time, which is growing on me. It's quite a nice tool. And in the 3D view you can see there isn't actually any components modelled because I didn't have time to do it, but it's not really worth it. If I flip this over we'll see the actual business ends, the actual copper. And that's how it's going to look, just how it works. And there's a hole for the potentiometer, which is important not to forget. DIY board making, you need to print these out on an acetate sheet. I also have a several copy so I can double these up to get a better contrast, which gives you a better etch. I'm going to chop this out around here. I'm going to make one smaller than the other so you can see it on top of the other one nicely. Just trim it up a little bit. Then stick the second layer on top, slide it around so it's nicely lined up. Break out the homebrewed light box. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to have it leaving the last thing I made in it. I've got a piece of single sided pre sensitized board here, so I'm just going to peel the plastic cover off, keep it facing uh, downwards, and place it on there with our design on the top. Shut the lid, plonk the light box on top. Three and a half minutes that needs. There we go, lights off, out it comes, and then into the developer. We start to see the design coming through. When that's done, let's give it a quick rinse. Let's wash it all off. There we go. Now to add the etchant, in this case it's ferric chloride. Not particularly pleasant stuff, but keep it off your skin and out your eyes, you'll be alright. Pull a bit of tape off. I'm just going to make a little handle for the back of this. Just want to float it on top of the section. Just like that. Balance it on there. There we go. Leave that to float for a while. So whilst the chemicals are doing their thing, I can harvest the parts one off this board, which is this pot for a start off. I've noticed the legs are bent over, so that's a bit of a horrible trick. 
So if I can get the soldering iron to bend them up. Seems like it might be bent sideways. Well, it's damaged the board, but yeah, I don't care. And now this one. Hope it's not so uh, bent over. Oh, they're rot as they have as well. Might be able to wiggle it loose if I'm lucky. Come on. There we go. Right on the floor. I reckon that looks done. Just let the drips drain off. And give that a dunk. Perfect. Next stage is to drill the holes. That's all cleaned up and labelled up now. Start loading the components.
I hope it fits. Prise this cap off again. I mark this one with a plus now because we know it's the right way. I'll try and wipe off this bogus one I did though. I don't know if it'll come off with IPA though. Oh, it has. There we go. <laughs> no, no, no. A bit of wiggling's going to be involved here, I think. There we go. Put the cover on. I think that's it. Let's see if I've got it right. Well, it's rotating. And it's not making a buzzing noise. So, I think I have got it right. Let's see how it plays. Just a bit slow that, speed it up a bit. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> That'll do. What the motor's done again, <laughs> what else is wrong? If I recall, I could never see this working, so I'm going to have a look into that. Allegedly, it can tell what type of dolby is on the tape automatically. I'd like to rule out the tape's being dodgy and ideally use a brand new one, but I don't have one. But I've got the nearest thing is one I've never listened to. Ooh. Let's open that. Get the obnoxious tape out there. Oh, I did play a little bit of it. Maybe a 30 seconds I played it before I took it out. <laughs> There's your automatic light still on. Let's see if it can detect it. Well. Just a blinking light. It's not having it, is it? Yeah. I've actually bothered to print the service manual for this now because I need it. And looking through here, hopefully explains how this thing works. Well, lots of diagrams. Then two diagrams. Ooh. Now we get to page 16 and here's the block diagram of how it works. All sorts of things going on there. And it mentions the auto dial up there. There's a few power supplies I should check. I reckon they're all working, but they're worth a look. And here we are, a description of how it works. The Auto Dolby Noise Reduction Selector System selects the noise reduction position automatically when playing back tapes recorded on this unit. Hmm. Okay. An ultra low frequency signal, table one, is recorded simultaneously when the source signal is recorded on the tape by selecting the Dolby Noise Reduction Auto and then selecting Dolby Noise Reduction B-Type or C-Type when recording with this unit. The presence, absence and type of ultra low frequency signal are detected during play to determine the noise reduction position. Well, who knew? So that can come out then. It's not going to tell me anything. So I do have blank tapes that are pretty good, never used. So. Let's pop that in there. Now to be a bit kinder to your ears, I'm going to record a 600Hz and 400Hz tone. A bit more gentle. And that sounds like this. So if I put it in Dolby B, press record, then play. And there you can see the left and right waveforms. There appears to be a little bit of modulation you can see. I would agree with very low frequencies, about 7 hertz and 9 hertz. It's supposed to be 7 hertz on the left channel, which is the blue line, 9 hertz on the right, which is the green. Of course, the advantage of the three head machine, you can listen to the source and the tape. And ideally, couldn't tell the difference between which is on. Doesn't sound bad. Press play. I'm on the lead with the tape now. Doesn't know what's happening.
There we go. Oh, nearly. Thinks it's B-type. It's not quite sure. I wonder about C-type. Would it perform better with that? Oh, oh, what's going on there? <laughs> That's not good. Right channel's gone mad. And a right weird sound too. Look at that. It's pegged the meter, making a squealing noise. It's not on the source, is it? No. Oh, crikey. Well, we haven't seen that with any of the playback before, so I think this is a recording circuit problem. Or maybe the Dolby oscillators? I mean, they were going crazy, weren't they? Now, the 7 and 9 hertz oscillators can be picked up on this chip here, this analog switch, which lives on the auto Dolby board, this big one here. You can just see it behind this capacitor and these wires. There it is. Easy to pry from the back. Who oh, were? Uh, it's pin one. We've got oscillation of some sort, we need to change the time base. Slow it down a bit. There we go, 100 milliseconds. Trigger menu, channel 1. Then I want to measure the frequency. Excuse me, struggling with the signal, low amplitude, so I'll zoom in a bit. Yeah, that's about 7 hertz here. Then the other one's on pin 4. Yeah, about 9 hertz. Yeah. That's working. Pin 8. 6.8, yeah. And then 9, 10, 11. 9 hertz on there. Okay. So the oscillators work. I've got to look elsewhere. I hit record, see if the fault's still there. And it appears to be worse than ever. Look at that. I'll turn the Derby off. Makes no difference. Well, slightly. <laughs> That's Derby C. Dolby B, and off. It's not fixing it. <laughs> well, scanning through the schematics, and there's a lot of them on here, I've had a look at the record circuit. The record is driven by this circuit here, and mainly by this op amp here, IC502, which is an NJM4560. There's no component IDs on the circuit board at all, so you have to use this guide in the service manual, and it's not the best. But the record and erase head goes into this plug here, so it's got to be around this area, I reckon. And here we are right at the edge, IC503, 504, and um, is that 502? Yes, right by these pots. I'm expecting a bit of a noisy signal, so I'm going to change the waveform to a ramp on the one channel, so I can tell them apart. I'll actually zoom in a bit on there, just so I can see them more easily, and I shall also turn off channels 2 and 3. Leave me channel 1 right in the middle. See what we've got. Just have to lift the front panel out of the way to see it. And there it is. I have to run this machine on its side to get at it. There we are recording. There's pin 8. Well that looks okay to me. And pin 2 is the output. Yeah! Not the mess we're hearing is it? The output to the record head looks alright to me. It certainly didn't correlate to that racket we're hearing. So it must be the playback. The playback head goes straight to this preamp circuit here. This is an IC201, which is an NJM2043SA. See if we can find that. And the playback head's connected to this plug here, next to this relay. And there's this chip right next to it, and it appears to be attached okay. I'm not sure if it is IC201 though. Can't read it. <laughs> so that's potentially it down there. Can't quite see the numbers, so get a torch on it. That's an NJM2043SA. If it is that chip, I can test the theory. Recording again. I'm going to hit it with some freezer spray. I think that's probably it. Now I'll see if I can get the faults return with a bit of heat. Just touch the side of the case with the iron. Oh yes. Well that's enough to convince me that that chip needs changing. If I can find one.
I don't actually have one of these. I've had one on back order for a week and then they've cancelled it. So yeah, I don't know. But I do have an NJM4560 which is also using this machine and it has the same pin out. So maybe this is a lower noise version. I don't know, but we'll try it. Just slide that into place. Well now it's in, let's hope it's as compatible as I think. Well there's no smoke yet, so good sign. I suppose let's record something. Well we've got two channels, one's a bit bigger than the other. Compare that to the source. Yeah, it might need calibrating. Don't know why it should though, but hey ho. Playback gain is adjusted here. Just compare it to the source again. It's got to come down quite a bit. A bit more. Can't tell them apart to the other channel. Before we throw that hissy fit on that one channel, I was looking at the Dolby detection. <laughs> See if that's working or not. So we're going to select Type B and record from the beginning. Then we're going to Type C. Let me press play, see if the Dolby detection can know what's going on. Well, it's picked up Type B, OK. A little bit of flashing going on occasionally, but it's mainly happy with it. And here's Type C, eventually. <laughs> Checking out the calibration section of the service manual shows you where to adjust the Dolby stuff and explains here how you can adjust the auto Dolby board to give you the 7 and 9 Hertz as well as the level it should be at. And the suggestion I use some antiquated test equipment here which I don't have. I'm assuming DB refers to decibels relative to 1 volt RMS. And there's two test pins to pick up on, test point 11 and 12 which is on chip IC1D. It's another single in line package just behind this capacitor. Pin 1 is what I need to check, which I can also get on this capacitor leg here, it's a lot easier to get to. I'll set the line input to no volts. This is set to 100 milliseconds division horizontally and 100 millivolts vertically. So I'm looking for about 360 millivolts peak to peak. I'm a bit concerned about this noise though, nothing on there yet. Well the waveform looks about the right sort of magnitude, but what is it right on that noise for? That's crazy. Not sure about this noise, it's not good. It's not mains noise because that would be either 50 or maybe 100 hertz over here. It's a lot slower than that, and it's all over the place. IC1D is part of a low pass filter network whose job is to block the audible signals and just let 7 and 9 hertz signals through. There's plenty of parts around here that could be causing weird glitches. And as long as nothing's coming in from this end, it must be coming from here. So I can play once this bipolar cap there, see if I get any noise. And there's none. It's totally flat. Okay. Onto this pin down here. The same. So we've got no noise coming in through this end. There's not a lot going on here, but I am suspicious of this capacitor here. Maybe if I disconnect that resistor, I can disconnect the two parts and see what's going on. Where we want to look, there's tape in the way, so if I can peel this off, at least partially, expose the bottom of it. There's pin one of the chip, there's the 5.6k resistor goes through there, and then we've got the capacitor I'm suspicious of. Although, although we're looking at it, it's not soldered properly. <laughs> not a dry joint. Well, that's easily fixed. 
typically this board's soldered in and it's in the way but this is on a plug weirdly but I need to undo these cables they're a bit tight I don't know if I've got enough wiggle room there's a bit at least I can get to it now it'd be a good idea to go over the whole board because we've got one dry joint there's often more Well, it's nice and flat now. Will it stay flat? Oh. Oh. Something just failed there. Something getting warm and failing. I wonder what it is. I just spent the last hour experimenting with that board, removing resistors, swapping capacitors and taking transistors out. Basically nothing worked. The only thing I can tell you is if I disconnect the input cable it's nice and quiet so it might just be an artifact of it being a low pass filter but I am going to swap the chip with another one on the board just in case and this chip on the main boards for the microphone input Let's try that. We have no waveform at all. In fact, if I zoom out, it's a bit slow to respond. It's a slow update on the scope. It's actually way off. It's down to one of the negative rails, minus seven volts or so. And I don't know why it's sat there. There's no rhyme or reason for it. I suspect there's something wrong with the feedback network in that filter but oh there we go it's just recovered and you can see it's all wobbly if I zoom back in 100 millivolts yeah and you can see trying to superimpose a 7 hertz signal on there it's going to be very confusing so it wasn't the amp chip so that might as well go back in So I've changed these capacitors here and this one here, I've even swapped the chip and even disconnected that resistor. When I did that I still had the sort of wiggly line coming out of this chip so it's definitely this way and it's not this part of the circuit. It's not clear what's causing this low frequency noise, I'm going to order some parts to rule them out but in the meantime I'm going to have to repair something else. So there will be a part three but maybe a bit later. <laughs> Catch you next time.